This is Dr. Tawari. And this is Dr. Kochak. And you're listening to the Breast Podcast Podcast Ever. Ever. Broadcasting from Columbus, Ohio, we'll be talking about plastic surgery procedures focusing on only the breast. Ranging from breast reconstruction to breast enhancement and reduction, we'll cover everything you ever wanted to know about the breast. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Breast Podcast Ever. I'm Dr. Kochak, and I'm here with Dr. Tawari, and we're super excited today because we have a very, very, very special guest with us today that we've had the pleasure of working with, and I'll let Dr. Tawari introduce her right now. Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's a fall morning here in Columbus, Ohio, and we have Dr. Tran Tu Win with us today, and Dr. Win is actually an amazing person. She is a surgeon. She is an entrepreneur. She is the director of the breast program at her institution. And I think she has a wealth of experience, not only in her development as a surgeon, but also in some of the very interesting entrepreneurial things she's been involved with. It's going to be exciting to talk to you about this. So Dr. Wynn, thank you for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat with you guys and catch up. Yeah, just before we started talking here on the podcast, we knew Dr. Wynn when she was a fellow, and she's now no longer a fellow, and we thought it'd be interesting. Wait, 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 wait. wait. What's that even mean? What what is a fellow? Yeah, what what is a fellow? fellow. She's she's Dr. Wynn. So I think for our listeners, maybe we take two seconds and let's review how we become doctors and surgeons already. So I think really quickly, I think for people who don't know the process, you know, when we start out, we start out as college students, and then we have to go to med school, and then we get into residencies. And during residencies, we're considered to be residents in training, right? But if we finish that, which is usually a specialty, and for Dr. Wynn, what was yours, Dr. Wynn? It was? General surgery. Yeah. So tell us about that. So you start in general surgery, and then what's this fellow business? I don't understand. General surgery is actually a very comprehensive training in terms of being exposed to, along with getting mentorship in various aspects of surgery from the, you get to operate from all different parts of the body and learn in various fashions from surgical care and critical care to in pre-op, post-op, and also perioperative skills that you get. Really, really wide breadth of, of information and also exposure. So it's a great training. So when you finish general surgery residency, you're a general surgeon, right? Yep, absolutely. Okay, so then what happens after that? So you went on to do additional training. Tell us about that. Yeah, I decided to hone my craft in breast health care and more specifically breast surgical oncology, helping patients with breast cancer and help them in terms of the surgical aspects, but also in their care in a survivorship and in care pre-cancer in terms of high-risk screening and also help treat benign diseases of the breast. I think it's very interesting for our listeners because you're a breast surgeon, but we're also breast surgeons, but we're breast plastic surgeons, right? So I think it's really good to point out that we work very closely with you uh, to be able to provide the full breadth of breast cancer care, right? Because you deal with the cancer side, you deal with basically surgically getting rid of the cancer, and then we come on in and do sort of the reconstructive parts. And so as a, as a two-part, you know, we're a great team and we're able to provide the comprehensive care as far as breast cancer goes. Yeah, absolutely. And you touched up a really key point there is the team effort and the multidisciplinary care. And part of the reason that I chose to do a fellowship was to do that. I think a bit of context to help understand this why someone would choose to do a fellowship versus being able to do this as a general surgeon because there are plenty of general surgeons who give great breast care and breast surgeries. And so for myself, that decision falls under the opportunities I was given in my general surgery training to be able to work at multiple different institutions from community places in Queens and Long Island, New York, and New Jersey, but also work in world-renowned places in rotations at Columbia and Sloan Kettering, and saw the opportunity to really focus and what differences there are to really focus in on breast health care and breast cancer care and what fellowship provides. And it really solidify my decision 
to do so in fellowship, being able to get exposed to all of the team members in a really comprehensive and, and fashion to be able to work with the radiology team, the pathology team, the medical oncology team, and also the radiation oncology team and the genetics component along with survivorship and working with the nurse navigation team to help give patient that really streamlined and up-to-date care of, of breast cancer and breast health. And of course, the oncoplastic and the plastic surgery team is a huge part of, of the opportunity to work with in fellowship, right, with you guys and see the various techniques that are truly up to date and cutting edge and really help change the lives of patients, not just in the short term, but in the long term, because this is something that they live with for the rest of their lives. Still one of the coolest words in all of medicine, I'd say, oncoplastic. <laughs> So, too, you finished the, your, your one-year fellowship. That's where we kind of got to know you at the different hospitals here. And now, so cool, you've, like, started a breast program. And uh, What institution are you at right now? I am up in upstate New York area, Finger Lakes, Ithaca. One of the most beautiful places in the country, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful place. I'm excited for the fall and the changing of the leaves. I'll send you guys some pictures. <laughs> and so... What does it mean to start a breast program? It must entail so many parts of your training. So t talk us through that. What does that mean? Yeah, and I think the great part about the fellowship was that it really helped build the foundation to understand where all the different puzzle pieces fall together and how they can really elevate the patient care process and how we all, in, in a multidisciplinary sense, but also in an operation sense, be able to understand how the parts become a whole. And so more specifically, I think the, the great part about where I have come and gone to in this area or this institution, what I really liked about this institution is that they have already made efforts and investment in creating and elevating women's health and breast health care. And so when we spoke in the beginning about the vision in which we have to really bring and optimize that care for the community, we knew that we were on the same page. And so the difference, I think, is really between fellowship and building a program is applying what we've learned in fellowship in order to get all those puzzle pieces that might now be disconnected and bring it all together. So working with the various teams from the direct patient care aspects to the operations aspect, bringing the team to understand upstream you know, the screening and the care and the referrals and how that may affect the patients and to the actual seeing the patient and then the downstream in terms of how do you care for them after you see them and what tools do we have in our toolbox to take care of them and bringing all the team members together to do so. It's a big endeavor. You know, it's a lot to, to take on to do a program in a place where they really haven't had a formalized breast program. How do you make it like a patient-focused program? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it takes a village. And I think that first being on the same page that we are truly patient-focused and patient-centered. And really, the, the other aspect about fellowship is not just the fellowship training, but you actually get at your disposal or at our disposal the network of people, the giants that, that we told us that we stand on, people who have done this, have built programs, have learned various aspects, and then applying those lessons from, from our wide network of professionals and, and leaders in this field to building this, this own program. And so it's really going back to what you asked, Dr. Tawari, is first there's patient focus, and then the second is just looking at the resources that we have now and where we want to go. And think about if it was ourselves or our loved ones, how would we want that optimal care and that process to be and go from there? I always kind of like to ask people that have finished their training, you know, what are the biggest challenges you now have as an attending versus being in training? Because it's a different mindset than when you were a fellow and certainly a resident. Well, well, to be fair, we're always in training, right? Like it never really ends. We're still learning every day. But Yes, Dr. Kochak, we are always learning. <laughs> well, yeah, they say that you learn something new every day. Doesn't it pre prevent Alzheimer's? So yes, keep on learning. Stay forever young. <laughs> but do tell us. 
Yeah, I think that the in fellowship we really get spoiled on the on the different people that we work with who have really honed their craft. And we get spoiled because we get to learn all these different cool aspects and techniques. Like I picked up many things I've learned from you guys and are applying it now. I've learned from your other fair, various mentors and surgeons and and physicians in, in the practice and the multidisciplinary team. And really, I think the, the, the difference is the accessibility to all these great people who have honed their craft and are truly, really great at what they do. And so it's changing from that team to another great team and learning all those, the different personalities in which the, the, they work and the process in which, which these the new group works and figuring out how those processes can be all integrated together. So really in, in fellowship, right, the, the formula is already figured out. And in, in practice, we are refining the, what we have and, and figuring out that formula in a way anew. It's cool to hear you say it that way because it's not something that I think a lot of people understand that there's a big difference as when you're a trainee versus when you're an attending. And it really means kind of drawing on a lot of your skills that aren't just medical or surgical. It's your personality. It's your ability to connect with people. You know, I think those become very important as you move on in your career. But the point that I, I really am fascinated about you is that you're not only a surgeon, but you're an engineer, you're an entrepreneur, and you've created really, I think, one of the coolest technologies that I've ever seen in surgery. So share with our folks, you know, what that is. Yeah, thank you. I definitely going back to, to the same, the motto that I have is it takes a village. I was really fortunate to be able to learn what I've learned and the opportunities that I've had to, to get exposed to many great things and many great people. So I think a little bit of context and background that would help tie it all together is I actually went through biomedical engineering before I became a doctor. In my undergraduate time and also a little bit of time in industry, I got to work in tissue engineering, nanotechnology, medical device, and DNA technology, and got to see a lot of that bench to bedside innovation and research, but one, still wanted to make a more directed impact. So I went back to medical school and became a surgeon. And in the trenches of medicine, really saw there were still so many different aspects that we can make improvements on. And so three years ago, more than three years ago, about three and a half years ago, our team came together from various expertise as clinicians, as engineers, as people who've worked in deep tech, as in robotics, AI, mixed reality, and people who've worked in medical device have, and leaders in, in that field, along with leaders in healthcare administration and regulatory, came together with a mission to improve patient care delivery, leveraging mixed reality and artificial intelligence really focusing on workflow optimization and integration. And what we've built out a lot of great cool tool sets for the bedside and in the OR. And I think maybe a little bit of context about what mixed reality is may be helpful for people. I know we've heard a lot about AI and artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think that's, that's a common thing now. But I think mixed reality is still an, an another great aspect of deep tech, more specifically the ability now to have wearables such as your glasses and have the computing power of your computer or your phone onto your glasses and be able to interact with the computed world along with the real world is where mixed reality really has the strength. And so that allow us in many ways to get key information that we have about patients, but about knowledge that we have to be exposed right in front of our eyes in our line of sight, along with collaboration with people remotely in a really meaningful sense. So what I say is that with mixed reality, next to teletransportation, you get to be able to bring in all the expertise and the knowledge that we have to be right in front of you as you take care of patients or as you deliver healthcare. We use your device, these OptiSurge glasses, and for people that have no idea what mixed reality is, as I did not, you're basically looking through these glasses and you get an image of a surgeon and a patient that are somewhere else, you know, and we talked about using this in, in, in the battlefield context, doing it in the training context, but it's a way to basically do surgery without being there and to like talk to people who are, 
way far away from you and be able to help them in these more complicated procedures. It really is some next level type stuff. Yeah, exactly. That is the the opportunity to really truly collaborate in a meaningful sense, even if you're not physically there. And so communication is on three different level audio, like we're doing now, but also visual being able to see from a first person perspective what someone else is seeing. And then the third level is annotation, the ability to exchange information in terms of whether it's drawing and pointing to things or pushing information in real time and really truly collaborate in a more meaningful sense. And that's just the telehealth, telecollaboration is just one of the tool sets in which our software platform can do. We have different integrations with surgical tool sets and things in the OR and, and also in other hospital tools as well. And we're excited to be able to, to share more about that in the future. Yeah, with this pandemic craziness, I think the tools that you guys are, are developing are going to be so useful and so important as we like have to figure out how to do surgeries and still be careful with COVID and all that kind of stuff. How, how has the pandemic affected your plans? Yeah, the pandemic has rearranged the world and really showed the gaps in care. And so it really helped us understand where we can make the most positive impact at this time. And so this the tool set that we're making available is largely driven by the needs that is being exposed by the pandemic, not just in the short term, but in the long term. Because I think that there is huge opportunities in telecollaboration uh, using a hands-free smart glasses system where you still get your, the ability to dynamically take care of the patient in front of you and collaborate with someone remotely while minimizing exposure and, of course, also save on PPE. And so to directly answer your question is that the pandemic allows us to look at the tools that we have to really bring value to f- help fill in the gaps that are out there. Yeah, Dr. Kojak and I have talked about using this technology to kind of remotely help for deep flap operations, you know, for people that may have some questions as they're doing the operation. It sort of opens up this whole new world. But just let us know when the robots are going to replace us so we know what else what else are we going to do, Dr. Kojak? I think I'm going to become a professional palm reader. That's my that's my goal. I'd say palm reading has its benefits for sure. <laughs> I'm going to grab these glasses just so that Dr. Tori can talk me through my parts of the surgery. I'll, I'll, feel, more, I'll feel more confident and comfortable. It'll make me feel great. As you know, Dr. Wynn, we, we travel to we travel far and wide to to do these operations in different areas with different people and this type of technology would certainly cut down on the drive time if we're able to collaborate with our colleagues through these types of technologies. It'll be actually fantastic. So keep working on it. We, we need it. Absolutely. And I think that we, we're excited because we, are, we have some great pilot partners that have already signed on and we're actually deploying our first pilots. We're looking towards November of this year. Of course, many things are currently in play, but that's that's one of our external goals. And I think that will help us really not just test out, but also show where we can make the most positive impact. Uh, we've had interest in variation. It, and, you know, like you said, you travel far and wide, Dr. Kojak. There's interest that to work with us from an international level as well. Just imagine to be able to bring your skills and your expertise to another continent where people don't really right now readily have access to that. I think what, what you guys do in microsurgery and the skill sets that you have is incredibly rare. And just to be able to help bridge that gap in knowledge with this type of technology that we have would be incredible. And of course, in many other applications as well. Well, that is absolutely astounding. You know, I was, while we were chatting, I kind of dropped a pin on the map to see, you know, where you are, these finger lakes and that kind of, wow, it looks gorgeous out there. <laughs> have you been out there, Dr. Tori? Yeah, that's one of my, it's near where, where I got married, actually, where my wife grew up. So we used to go there all the time to the Finger Lakes. It really, if anyone has not been to the Finger Lakes, put it on your bucket list because they are gorgeous. Well, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to let you know, Dr. Wynn, that at some point if you have some, you know, talks or things that, you know, surface as you build your program. If there's the need to have someone come out and talk about microsurgery, I'm going to volunteer. <laughs> and let you know, but I'll be there uh, at the drop of a hat. I'm ready. That looks beautiful out there. So did you grow up in sort of like that type of an area or is this new for you to be 
in that type of a natural setting. It's incredible. <laughs> it's a bit new in, in that we haven't lived in this area of New York before. We lived for a while in Manhattan, the city, which also I really love. And then we also lived in California, uh, which is also another beautiful place pre all the smoke. And so do appreciate the outdoors and the countries. And I think they also, the Finger Lakes are also very famous for their wines and addition to the wineries. So I think it's a, definitely a great place. In fact, they have a lot of great farm stands around here. And we had our first purple bell peppers recently. I don't know if you guys ever had purple bell peppers. I'm a huge pepper fan <laughs> too. So like, no, does it taste different from a bell pepper that's another color? Because the red and yellow ones taste, I think, pretty different from a green one. Dr. Kojak and I are pepper bell colorblind. We don't see any color. Oh, <laughs> well, well, once you experience this, no, it's actually, it does taste like a bell pepper, but in many ways is much lighter and more refreshing. And the color is absolutely beautiful as well. We're going to have to get our hands on some purple peppers. Yeah. The rough part about the Finger Lakes is when it gets cold because boy, it gets cold. Yeah, I, I heard, and I don't know, I, this is my first winter here, I'll keep you posted, but you know, I am vertically challenged in that, as you have operated with me, several steps <laughs> were needed. So I was told that there might be a chance that the snow will get taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to throw it out there as they may want to become formal sponsors of the Breast Podcast ever. You might have to get yourself one of those Canada Goose Down coats because I hear yeah. that. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I think that's a great idea. <laughs> You've got so much going on with your program, you know, being a clinical surgeon, seeing patients, treating patients, developing this company. How do you keep all this together? I mean, it's just, I'm getting dizzy just kind of thinking about what you have to be doing in your, in your every day. It's funny you guys say that because I know for a fact that you guys wear a bazillion hats as well. And I'm... <laughs> well, we're, we're just looking for tips on how to manage it better. So yeah, go but ahead there's, and tell us. there's two of us. There's only one of you. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I'm not named two for a reason, why? <laughs> so I think that's a great question. <laughs> I think that's that, you know, I am always very appreciative and grateful for the amazing people that have come into my life and have joined our journey. It truly takes a village and, you know, in terms of even from the business aspect of the company, have amazing people, people who have really honed their craft in what they do. Let me just highlight some examples. So within our optic surge, we have people that have worked for decades in deep tech, have been with multiple technical transformation and and they've joined our journey. And we've had people who've worked in medical device and have been leaders there and have commercialized a lot of great products. People who used to work for the FDA or have worked in regulatories from large and small companies. And so in addition to that, you know, a lot of great support network in our development team and such. So all of that to say that it's really a team effort in everything that we do and being able to really let the people who are experts in what they do, provide necessary leadership within the team in order to make that happen. And so I've been very lucky that I got all these people to help join that journey. And then in addition to that, from a practice standpoint, I think in a very similar way, we have great people who are experts at what they do, who share the same mission and same passion and love for providing the most optimal care and breast health care and breast cancer care. And so being able to work with those people is really a privilege as well. And of course, I think that personally in my life, I've just have great people in a professional fashion, but also in a personal fashion, such as you guys, to where I can be able to connect with and be able to have the necessary support and learn from each other. And so the reason that I think we're able to do all this is really, it takes a village and we've been really blessed. And I think with opportunities that we've given, we have the the responsibility of paying it forward to make a difference, to make a positive impact. And I think that what helps drive, you know, the, how we're, when we wake up every day and uh, to be, stay motivated to do that. And of course, you need to get respite when needed. I'm a huge fan of, of self-care and, and going with the flow and be able to, to, to take the time that we need in order to regroup personally with our family, with our friends, with our team. Those are some solid words of wisdom right there, Dr. <laughs> Wynn. I love it. 
Well, I think, I don't know, we don't want to keep you too long here on a Saturday morning. I think it's been a fantastic conversation. And I think we've all gained a lot of insight around, you know, it's fantastic that you've been able to go from residency to fellowship to attending and all the while still developing a medical device company that we're sure is going to go on to be a pretty big deal. So, you know, I think I want to say thank you so much for taking the time. And also, I'm really, really glad we got to meet you while you were training. And I think this is going to be fantastic to know you moving forward. We're going to see you do amazing things out there in the Finger Lakes, maybe even more than Purple Peppers. Yeah, well, and you guys are welcome anytime, social distantly during this time and, you know, and then in the future. And I do agree that people should check out the Finger Lakes and, and what we're doing here in, in Ithaca in terms of improving women's health and breast health care. So thank you so much for the opportunity. It was so great to catch up and looking forward. Before we wrap up here, maybe, you know, where can people find more information about the, the products that you're developing and the technologies that you're moving forward? Yeah, so we have a website that is pretty informative. Uh, the website is opticsearchinc.com. So it is O P T I C S U R G I N C dot com. And we'll put that link attached in the description of today's podcast so that people can go and, and learn more about this amazing technology that we've had the pleasure of trialing out. So it, it'll be definitely worth their time to check it out and see what you're up to. Sounds great. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. We hope you found this episode helpful. Want more info? Connect with us at mwbreast.com. And go behind the scenes with us on Instagram at mwbreast. Thanks for tuning in. And join us next week.